All right, so we're going to be continuing on here. There's somewhat of a series, but I think it's really important, and we need to do this probably about once every year where we go through just basic fundamentals and doctrines that we believe in this church. There's things that, you know, what, what I'm going to be preaching tonight for probably everybody here isn't going to be something you've never heard before. It's not going to be some brand new thing. But there are things that we need to be reminded of continually in God's Word. We, Brother Robert and I were talking about this a little bit earlier today that, you know, the majority of even coming to church and the things that you hear is going to be things that you've already heard before and things you already know that we need to continually just stay refreshed in our mind and go back and not get too carried away off into some other path. And, you know, it, when you don't get these things, the, the, the basics, the fundamentals just kind of coming back to you regularly, it's easy to start getting off in, into some strange territory where you're constantly trying to find some new thing and some new doctrine. And we're going to be reaffirming what we believe here on a regular basis. So last week I talked about, you know, part of the milk of the word from Hebrews chapter six was, you know, the laying on of hands, you know, we're going to, where I explained the, the, the biblical just, just laying on of hands, receiving the Holy Ghost and, and laying on of hands and sending out, um, elders and, and um, disciples to go out and do work. And um, this evening we're going to be covering something probably even more simple than that. I mean, it, just rudimentary, talking about the eternal security of the believer. Amen. This is a doctrine that, I mean, these doctrines, by the way, that we're coming up, they're, they're non-negotiable, right? They're, these, are, these doctrines are recovering in this little series, you know, going through the next few weeks or whatever. These are things that we don't budge on, we don't compromise on, we don't say, oh, well, I believe a little bit different. No, look, these are, these are foundational truths. Eternal security of the believer, if you don't believe this, you're not even saved. Yeah, right. and, and I'm going to get to that and prove that to you, why that's the case. But this is so fundamental and so important to the faith. That like uh, you, th this is this is the gospel. This is part. You know, it, you cannot have the gospel without eternal security. So we started off reading John chapter three, probably one of the best chapters for to to get somebody saved that's ever written with with the most famous verse in the world, John three sixteen, right? Which encapsulates the gospel in very simple into one verse. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. One verse has been so loved and so tauted and, and translated into probably every single language on this earth. Why? Because the simplicity of the gospel is, is encapsulated in that one verse. Now, before I get into eternal security, you know, John 3 does a great job of just pointing out that, that our salvation is by grace. It's through faith. It's just believing. Right? There is no work involved. It is a matter of putting your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how we're saved. It has nothing to do with our good works. You know, the most common thing you run into when you go out and try to preach the gospel to people is that they're not relying on the gospel, they're relying on themselves. And people don't even realize that. They don't even think about it that much. And that's, that's one of our jobs. Now look, if you, you know, everyone in here probably agrees with the, with the doctrine I'm teaching tonight, you know, this isn't something new, but pay attention and take note for the soul winning that you do. Because this is extremely important to articulate to people this concept of the eternal security of the believer and what our job is when, we're, when you're speaking to somebody else, when you're speaking to someone who's lost, you need to get them to see, for, well, for one thing, that what you believe is different than what they believe. You may get a lot of people at the door, oh yeah, we're saved by grace through faith. A lot. That happens a lot. Because people will hear that and repeat it. Oh yeah, saved by, gra by grace in Jesus Christ. Yep, it's not of our works. And they'll have that part right. 100% right. But then they're still not saved. Because they still didn't quite grasp or understand the gospel fully. And it's not because it's some difficult concept. It's just because they had been hearing some things repeated and they never fully understood it or accepted it, relied upon it, right? I, I was giving the gospel to the girl today and I explained the part where it says um, in Acts 16, right? So it says, what must I do to be saved? And it said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And I usually make it a point to say, you know, 
a lot of, it says there, it says to believe on Jesus. Now, without making it too complicated, you know, a lot of people I talk to will say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. You hear that a lot. People can repeat that phrase many times. I believe in Jesus. But what does it actually mean? And what do they mean when they say that? Believing on Jesus Christ for your salvation, the way that I always explain it is like this. Imagine you were to die today and you were to be confronted with God. And God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? Whatever your answer is to God, whatever comes out of your mouth is what you are believing on to go to heaven. That's it. That, that, the answer to that question, why should I let you in? Lord, Lord, I, I prophesied in thy name. Lord, Lord, I've done many great works and I went to church and I helped people out and I really didn't do anything that bad. I mean, yeah, I'm not perfect, but I've done all these other things. But, but look, I mean, look, I help animals, right? My neighbor is 80 years old and I go and get her groceries for her. These are things that many people today are relying on. That's what they're trusting. I mean, just ask them. You want to know what someone believes about being saved? Ask them. That's what we do when we go out soul winning. We ask people, hey, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? Why? Why are you going? Oh, because I've repented all of my sins and I'm living a good life. Oh, because I ask for forgiveness every single time I sin. Oh, because I do, you know, all these various reasons. And every, whatever they tell you, that would be just like, that's what you're going to tell God. Why should he let you into heaven? Because of all these different things. You can say you believe in Jesus, but that's not what the Bible means when that's the requirement for being saved. What it means is that if God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? You say, because of Jesus. That's believing on Jesus. Because Jesus died for my sins. Because he paid the punishment that I deserve to pay. He did the whole thing. He did all the work for me. He offered up a free gift and I put my faith on him. That's what I'm trusting in is what Jesus did for me. That's the gospel. And it's simple. Yeah. And, and the devil wants to make it confusing, and that's why he uses churchianity. That's why he uses all these various you know, de denominations and false gospels to confuse people. Because he doesn't want people to be saved, but it's very simple. Thank God it's so simple. But our job is to make it easily understood to the people we talk to. So many people are not saved simply because they have not understood the simplicity in the gospel. But so many people also are not saved because they reject the simplicity of the gospel. We're looking for those people who just need to understand. And for those people, we need to make sure we're doing the best job that we can using as much Bible verses as we can to explain the freeness of salvation and the, the eternal aspect of salvation. Because here's, here's why eternal security is so important. We see over and over again, faith, believe. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we say, see, it's just believing, it's faith, it has nothing to do with your works. And I'll tell you what, a lot of people, people I talk to today, the, the girl I got saved today was agreeing with, oh yeah, yeah, it's not of works. Yep, we can't do it. I talked to another lady today, same thing. Yep, not based on our works. Oh, it's through Jesus. I, I asked her, I thought she was saved at first. Because well, I asked her, she's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to heaven. And I said, why? She said, because of Jesus. And I got to get this big smile. I was just like, that's awesome. Because that's the right answer, because of Jesus. But then when I just asked the follow-up question, so do you think you could ever lose that? You know, I mean, is there something you can do? Do you think you uh, oh, yeah, I'm sure there probably is. And here's the danger of that. And here's why, you know, for, especially for someone who believes it is not based on your works. If it's not based on your works to receive the best gift in the world, eternal life, has nothing to do with your works, then how in the world can it po be even possible that you could lose that salvation based on your works or lack thereof? And see, this is the danger of, of not believing in eternal security. This is why it's inherent to the gospel and this is why I say you're not saved if you don't believe it. It's because if there's something that you can do to lose your salvation, then it has to do with you. And you have to rely on yourself to some degree 
whatever, you know, people want to put that bar wherever they want. Well, you can't do this. Well, you can't do that. Well, you can't just fill in the blank. You can't, you could sin, but you can't willfully sin. You could, you know, and, and whatever it is. Okay, so you, so then you have to make sure that you stay saved by doing work. By, and you know what the doing the work is? Obeying God's laws. And then it boils down to a salvation based on God's law. But Romans 3, turn if you would, Romans chapter 3, verse number 28. If you don't use this verse, I highly recommend that you use this. Romans 3, 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Keep these, you know, I, I'm sure many, you know these verses well, but keep these in mind because the number one obstacle when you go out soul winning is trying to convince people First of all, explain to them what the gospel is and then convince them that it truly is eternal. It truly is forever. It really is a free gift. And you need to make the connect, help them to make the connections in their mind. Because when they start up, when you start off having a conversation, they don't th they're not thinking that, oh, well, if I screw up, if I do this, if I do that, then, yeah, God's going to take it away from me. They're not thinking they're relying on the law or themselves because they've had it crammed in their head so much that salvation is by grace through faith, that it has nothing to do with their works, which, in a way, that could come out helpful then when you, when you draw the connections and show them, hey, look, right? I mean, you believe this. It's not of works, right? Then why would it be based on your works afterwards? And point that out. And, and it can't be because then, then, then it's just contradictory. Which is, again, why it's so inherent to the gospel. Salvation is simple. It, it, is, it is completely bought and paid for. Jesus paid our way into heaven. He wants, God wants everyone to be saved. And God wants everyone to be saved so much that he did all the work for us. And that's the good news. You, know, people, you tell people, hey, do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God wants you to go to heaven? Yeah. Well, it doesn't even get any better than him doing everything for you. Everything in the world. And the only thing required of us is to receive a free gift just by trusting him. The gift is eternal. How many times do you see the word eternal or everlasting in the Bible, especially in regards to salvation? It's over and over again, right? I mean, I, did, I was going to do the study, but I think I did just the word eternal like 20, 30 times. Or verses, I mean, not even times, but verses in the Bible. And I didn't even do everlasting, which is going to be another at least probably 20 or 30 times. Words carry meaning, of course. And when the word is used so much, and, and this is another hang-up for people, and when people want to deny this, this fundamental doctrine of, of eternal security. And, oh, by the way, what I mean by eternal security, I mean that you are secure in your salvation for eternity, forever. It's not something you have to, once you are saved, you are always saved. You are saved forever. It's not something you have to be worried about. Oh, well, what if I do this? What if I do No, you're saved. Did you put your faith in Jesus Christ? You're saved. You're saved forever. You are secure in that belief. You don't have to worry, wonder, question. Yes, you're saved. That's the doctrine that we're talking about tonight. The word eternal alone proves the eternal security of the believer. By definition, th these verses would not make sense and again, it's another illustration that I used. I, um, Romans 6, 23, right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life. Does eternal ever end? No, literally, the word itself, E, is a, is, means not, and turn is like a termination. It's not ending. It's, it's the same, me, it's the same uh, concept as everlasting, but it's, the, it's, it's the, different, the other side of the coin, right? Other side of the same coin. So everlasting means it continues forever. Eternal means it never ends. There is no end point. Two ways of saying the same exact concept. It continues and continues and continues and continues. So something, some, and I know this is going to sound really stupid, real simple stupid, but it, this is how simple it is. Either something is eternal or it's not. Either something has an end 
or it has no end. And what God has promised to us is life that has no end. No end at all. So in order for him to make a promise to us and to give us something that has no end, it has to have no end. Right. <laughs> it, 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 it's so simple. But people want to confuse it. God gave us eternal life. Life that never ends. Think about this. Does eternity ever end? No, because otherwise, how could it be eternity? Eternity means forever. It's going to continue on. Is it really eternity if there is an end? No. Is eternal life really eternal if it ends? No, of course not. Eternal life will never end. My favorite verse in the whole Bible is John chapter 5, verse 24. I use this almost Every single time I give the gospel, if I, if, if I give a thorough presentation every single time, without a doubt, every single time, depending on how fast I have to go through the gospel of somebody and how much they're willing to listen. But I always try to hit John 5, 24, because this is one of those verses that speaks to me personally as far as just the clarity and understanding of this and, and the, the portraying of, the, of the, the gospel being eternal how well it, it communicates this thought, better than any words that I could come up with on my own. John 5, 24 is a promise from Jesus Christ. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. So there's a word again, everlasting. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And one of the reasons I always explain this to people, one of the reasons I love this so much is that you find three different verb tenses all wrapped up into this one verse. He that believeth hath everlasting life. That's present tense. And this is an important concept too that, that, that is associated with eternal security is that it, salvation is not something you receive later when you die. Some people have this concept that, well, I'm going to be confronted with God and then I'll either be you know, given eternal life or I'll be cast into hell or something like that. No, 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 that's not the way it works. You receive eternal life immediately when you believe. The moment you put your faith on Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. So that half everlasting life, that is present tense. You have it right now. And shall not come into condemnation. That's the future. That's a promise. You say, look, you have everlasting life right now, but not only do you have it right now, and not only is it everlasting, which means forever. By the way, I'm going to reiterate and say you shall not come into condemnation. That's something that's not going to happen to you because right now you have everlasting life. So in the future, you shall not come into condemnation. Now, if somebody were to have everlasting life today, and then they come into condemnation by God because God sends them to hell. Is this verse true? It can't be. It has, it has to work. Otherwise, Jesus' promise is false. Say, well, I believe right now. You believe right now? You have everlasting life. And if you have everlasting life right now, Jesus said you shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's, that's like a past tense. It's already happened. You've passed from death unto life. Every single person as a, as, a, as a sinner, once you are held responsible for your sin and you knowingly or willfully um, commit a transgression of God's law, your spirit dies. Just like the Apostle Paul said, I was alive once without the law. When the law came, sin revived and I died. That's what I firmly believe is that as a child, as an infant, as a, as a conceived human being in the womb, your spirit's alive. And that's why children that die go to heaven when they die. Even young children, infants, right? They don't know right from wrong. They don't know God. They don't know anything. You know, they start learning more and more and more. But at some point, they learn right from wrong. They learn that there's a God and God's got a law and, you know, and the day that they sin, 
Just like with Adam and Eve in the garden. The day that they sin, thou shalt surely die. And the day that we sin, the first time, we died spiritually. But the moment you believe, your spirit is born again. You're revived. And you're vi revived to everlasting life. It doesn't ever end after that. You say, yeah, but what if we sin again after that? You will sin after that. But that doesn't kill your eternal spirit now that's born again. And I'm not going to get into it. There's a, lot, there's a lot more to get into in 1 John about that that talks about the new man versus the old man. And uh, that's a little bit outside of the scope of the, the doctrine tonight. But Jesus says, you've passed from death unto life. So as a sinner, you're headed towards death. You're headed towards hell because you're a sinner. And you are responsible for paying for your sins. But the moment you accept the substitution death of Jesus Christ and accept the payment that he made for you, that is what's applied to your account. Now you're no longer headed towards death. Now you've already passed at, from headed towards hell to headed towards life. It's a one-time event. It happens and it's over. And praise God for that. Turn your foot to 1 John chapter 3. If the gift is eternal and we receive the gift by believing on Jesus, how could we possibly lose it? 1 John chapter 3 defines sin as transgressing or breaking God's laws. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, just on a little bit of a side note here, I've mentioned this before, but um, you know, people that want to tell you you have to repent of your sins or turn from your sins, well, if you're turning from sin and sin is breaking the law, do you know what you're turning to? You're turning to the law. Instead of breaking the law, now you're keeping the law. That's what you do when you repent of your sins. Now, they want to replace the turning to the law with Jesus Christ, but that doesn't make any sense. That you can't turn from sin to something completely different. If you're, if you're turning from sin, you're turning to the law. I mean, that's, that's what the turn is. So obeying the law then would be a works-based salvation. But um, sin is a transgression of the law. Now, do we no longer have eternal life if we break God's law? Of course not. Everybody sins. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, you can flip back to chapter 1, verses number 8 and 10, and this is important. You know, there's a few people out there that believe in this holiness, that think that you can achieve a sinless per per, uh, perfection state. It's rare. It doesn't, you don't come across it very often, but the, the people are out there that think that you can live a life where you don't sin. Well, 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And in verse 10, it says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So the Bible is saying very clearly, look, you're a sinner. And if you say you're not a sinner, you're lying. You're deceiving yourself. The truth's not in you. Of course we sin. So do we lose our salvation every time we sin? What do I need to do after I believe and then sin if eternal life isn't eternal, if my salvation isn't secure? Do I have to believe again? I already believe. Do I have to believe harder, more sincerely? And see, this is where the confusion comes in. When you don't believe that it lasts forever, then, then these, these questions will start to maybe make sense somehow. Like, well, what do I have to do? Do I have to keep all the commandments? Which ones? All of them? Some of them? The really, you know, not getting to the really bad sins? And this is, you know, people have the whole spectrum. You can't get drunk. Well, you can't fornicate. But, you know, we're all sinners. So, you know, it's like they come up with this sliding scale of what's acceptable in God's eyes. But I'll tell you what, no sin is acceptable in God's eyes. Not one. That's why the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse number 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, you keep everything in God's law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. 
For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And that's what matters. So don't think that, oh, I don't do this and that sin is going to keep you out of hell. Or get you into heaven. Because as soon as you commit one sin, that you could keep the entire law. You break, that, you break one of God's commandments the least of God's commandments and you deserve hell and you do not deserve heaven. I quoted this verse earlier, Romans 3, 28 is a great verse. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It has nothing to do with obeying the law. So it, it never was to receive the free gift nor to keep the gift afterwards. To maintain your salvation has nothing to do with the law. Romans chapter 4, verse 5, but to him that worketh not. And this is a great verse to use for that, to that end. Well, people say, oh, well, yeah, you get it for free, but you have to then, you know, obey God's laws and do good to people and do all this other stuff in order to keep it. Well, then why does Romans 4, verse 5 say, but to him that worketh not? They're not doing any good works. They are not going out and helping their neighbor. They are not going out and going to church. This is they work not. You know what that means? They're not doing any good work. <laughs> they work not. It's very simple, right? Let's just take the Bible for what it says. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith, what he believes, is counted for righteousness. What's righteousness? Doing right. The very faith that he has, God counts that for doing righteous. Look, you, you don't have to like it. I think this is great. I love it. Amen. But it's what the Bible says. So whether or not you like it, or you think that's right, or you think that's fair, doesn't matter because this is God's word that's saying, to him that worketh not. Well, there has to be some kind of change. You got to do something different in your life. You got to prove that you're saved. Look, to him that worketh not, but believeth. It exists. If it didn't exist, it wouldn't be in the Bible. Just like they want to turn to James chapter 2, a faith without works is dead. Does faith without works exist? Well, no, no. If you have real faith, then you're going to be doing works. Well, then why does the Bible say faith without works is dead? Is it possible to have faith without works? Yes. Yes. Is it possible to him that work not but believeth? Yes. It is possible. The Bible mentions it in two places, James 2 and Romans 4. Is that person saved? Yes. Why? Because it has nothing to do with God's law. Nothing. The gift we received is not based on obeying God's law, but putting our faith in Jesus. Matthew 7, I alluded to this earlier. But one point that's extremely important for understanding the eternal security of the believer, for anyone who thinks that you could lose your salvation, a lot of people actually like to turn to Matthew 7 and say, see, look, you have to do good works. Let's turn there. Turn to Matthew 7. I actually, it's funny because every once in a while I get in conversations with people that want to prove a works-based salvation and they want to turn to Matthew 7 and I always show them and I say, that's funny. You want to go to Matthew 7 because look, I have it highlighted in my Bible because this is what I use when I go out soul winning. I highlight verses that I like to show people because I actually love to use Matthew chapter 7 to show people eternal security and to show people that it is impossible to lose your salvation because Matthew 7 proves that 100%. It does not prove a works-based salvation. What they, what, the way that they read this or take this is that, see, look, even people who seem to be doing really good aren't going to make it, so that means you have to do really good. No, that's not what it's saying. Look at verse number 21 of Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And you know, that is an absolute true statement. You know, I mentioned earlier, a lot of people say, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, a lot of people do say that. It doesn't make it true. It doesn't mean that that's all they're trusting in for their salvation. They say they believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people claiming the name of Jesus Christ, claiming to trust the God of the Bible or believe in him. But not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. 
But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You know what the will of the Father is in heaven? That you believe on his Son. That's right. That is what God wants. That's what will means. It's what he wants. What does God want for you to do? He wants you to believe. He wants you to be saved. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Many will say to me in that day, what day is that? The day that they're confronted with God. Remember I said if you were to die and be confronted with God and you would ask you why should I be, why should I let you into heaven? Well, some, many, not some, many are going to have this answer. Lord, haven't we, pro we preached in your name? In the name of Jesus, we preached to people. We put on these big events and we had the faith healers and we had all these other people and we told people to turn from their sins and they cleaned up their lives and look at all this great work that we did in your name. We cast out devils. And we've done so many great works for you, God. But what do you say? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why are they they that work iniquity? Because their sins were not forgiven. Their sins were not covered. They're sinners. They never received Jesus Christ as their Savior. They were never relied on Jesus Christ to save their souls. What were they relying on? Their many wonderful works. And don't skip over the fact that Jesus said, or God's going to say, I never knew you. These people weren't saved and then lost their salvation because they've committed some horrible sin. Otherwise, he couldn't say, I never knew you. He'd have to say, well, I used to know you. What happened to you? You backslid. No. I never knew you. Who are you? You didn't come to me through the sun. Who are you? You're just a sinner. You claim to be righteous doing all these works. That's why I have Matthew 7 highlighted there because he says, I never knew you. So if you were to Titus chapter 1, Why is, why is eternal security so important? Why is it such a foundational doctrine? Why is it true? Because God can't lie. It is impossible for God to lie. Otherwise, if God lied, he wouldn't be holy. But we serve a holy God, a true God. Everything that God says is true. Every word of God is true. Titus 1.2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. What did he promise? Eternal life. He didn't promise temporary life. He didn't promise a workspace of it. He promised. He made a promise that I'm going to promise you eternal life. Eternal means forever. And that's a promise. Now look, eternal by itself literally ought to just imply and tell you it has to last forever. But then he goes on and says, Look, he promised it. God's not going to give you something, say it's eternal, call it, here's a gift, all you have to do is believe, oh, you believe, here you go, you have it, it's eternal, and then later on, oh, well, you know, it's not really eternal. He promised. God is faithful. He's going to keep his word. One of the things in, uh, turn if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, just a few, a few pages back, um, which is actually a really good objection. I want you to remember this reference if you don't already know it. Because when you, you know, when, I, when you give the gospel to people, sometimes you'll get people that, that are really thinking about what you're saying. Uh, and that's <laughs> obviously who we're looking for. We want people to be really thinking about what God's word says, Right? because they're going to receive it the best or the easiest because they're not just placating you and letting you say whatever you want to say. They're, they're thinking about it. And one of the things that some people will come up with is, okay, salvation is by faith. It's by believing, right? Believe on Jesus. And say, I know there's no sin that I can do that's going to make me lose my salvation because it's not based on the law, right? And they get to that point and they, and they could understand that and say, okay, well, yeah, it's not the law. It's not the thing. But 
what happens if I stop believing, right? I'm not talking about going out and committing murder or anything like that, but if I just stop believing. I mean, if I, you know, I'm not believing, so how could I have eternal life? And that's a very good question. It's a very thoughtful question. It's a question that makes sense. They're following the line of thinking. 2 Timothy chapter 2, though, explains perfectly that once, once you have already received that free gift, it's, it's yours. That was the moment you received it. It doesn't ever get taken away from you because God is faithful or true to his word. So, and I'll explain this a little bit further in a minute, but look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 13. I, I literally just showed someone this verse today. I had this example come up today in soul winning. And unfortunately, the lady had to go because there's other things going on. But she was, she was getting it, and she thanked me. She was like, wow, I never really thought about this before. And unfortunately, I couldn't really finish the, the whole presentation, but I got to this point. Um, and I'll read it in context, too. In verse number 11, the Bible says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. If we stop believing, say if we, if we believe not, who's we? Timothy is Paul. Apostle Paul's writing this letter to Timothy, right? If we believe not, yet he abides faithful. A good example of, of, of what this is referring to, well, what do you mean staying faithful? He abides faithful. Husband and wife, right? Maybe one of them wants to get a divorce. Say the wife wants to get a divorce. She wants to turn away. I want nothing to do with my husband. I want, to, you know, I want to end this. I have nothing to do with this. I don't love him anymore. I don't care about him. Well, the, the faithful husband is going to say, no, I still, want to, I still am going to remain married to you because I made a vow, right? You may want to have nothing to do with me. You may not believe in me anymore, but I am going to remain faithful to my word because I vowed until death do us part, right? This is the stance that God takes. He says, when you believe, you receive the free gift. He says, I told you that. And you know what? I gave it to you and you had it when you believed. I'm not going to go back on my word because now you stopped believing in me. Because now you don't think I'm your father anymore. Well, guess what? When you were born into this family, I was your father and I'm still your father, whether or not you want to believe that or not. If my daughters or my sons grow up and they say, Dad, you know what? I don't even think you're my legitimate dad. I think that mom committed adultery and you're not my dad. Well, guess what? I'm still their dad. That doesn't change anything. I may be angry with them or upset with them. We might have a bad relationship as a result of that. I'm still going to love them because I'm their dad. And when we're born into God's family, you're born one time into God's family. You can stop believing that he's your dad, theoretically, right? I mean, I don't know. I, I, the, you know when people bring up these objections, I say, I don't, even know, I don't even know if that happens. Does it happen? I don't know. I can't say that I know that for sure. To me, it's like, you know, when I got saved, I received the Holy Spirit indwelling within me. And I know that I knew that I was saved even in, in my worst situations after your know, back, most backslidden state. I still knew I was saved. I still knew I was a child of God. But that's my experience. I don't know. That's what I know. I mean, the Bible, the Bible also says, you know, who hath bewitched you that you should, you know, that you should get into all these false doctrines and false gospels and everything like that. I mean, you see, you see a lot of crazy things so people getting way off base in some areas. I can't necessarily say that they're, you know, that they're not saved based on what the Bible says. So, um, but all you can go off of is what a person says right now. Right. I mean, if a person were to say right now, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, I'd say then you're probably not saved. Then you're not saved, right? I mean, that would be my judgment of that. But if they had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart previous to that, then they are saved. Right. It's as simple as that. But I'm not, I mean, all I can do, like, I'm not God. I can't see their heart. I don't know their history. 
God does. But I'm going to treat people based off of what you say right now. That's all you can do. That's all we can do. It's all that's expected of us. However, the, the, I mean, even in that situation, you stop believing. The Bible says God's going to remain true to his word. He is faithful. He cannot lie. He cannot go back on a promise. The promise is there and it's good forever from God. It may be different if the Bible gave you a different stipulation and said, well, here is actually how you are saved and this is how you stay saved. If, if that was found in Scripture, then that would be the truth. But you know what? That's not found in Scripture. It's not, there's nothing found that says, well, you have to do this and this and this to maintain your salvation. It's nowhere. What we do see is God remaining faithful, God not lying, God being true. So if you go to 1 John chapter 5, again, go, go forward a little bit. 1 John chapter 5, and, and this is where I really want to hit home and prove, you know, I made the statement before that if you don't believe in eternal security, if you don't believe once saved, always saved, you're not saved. 1 John 5, because look, our salvation, it's evident. It's based on what we believe. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There's so many verses that say, believe, believe, believe. So what do you have to believe? So what do you have to believe then? What is it that if we don't believe, then we're not saved? First John chapter 5, we'll start reading in verse number 10. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And this is what I was referring to earlier. You have the witness in yourself. It's there. Like There's a witness saying that you are God's Son. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is a very simple statement that this is making. He's saying, look, if someone makes a statement to you, if you don't believe, if you don't believe what they're saying, then what, you, what you're saying is that they're lying. What you're believing is that, well, then they're lying. Right? I mean, it's one or the other. Even if you say, well, I'm not sure if I believe you. If you're saying, I'm not sure if I believe you, then what you're saying is, I'm not sure if you're lying to me. Right? <laughs> you either have the truth or a lie. Anything, you know, the truth is very simple. It's one thing, the truth. Everything else falls into the lie category. So what God is saying, look, there is a witness that has been provided to you of Jesus Christ. There is a record in God's word that has been given to you. And if you don't believe that, then you're saying God lied. Why? Because these are God's words. That's why you're making God a liar. So, well, I don't think that's God's word. Those are man's words. Well, you could think whatever you want, but if the fact, if the truth of the matter is they're God's words, nothing can change that. Your opinion doesn't change that. What someone else said that these are man's words doesn't change that. If it's God's word, it's God's word. And if you're not believing it, then you're saying that God's a liar. And this is specifically the record. It goes into detail. Now, well, what is that record? If I don't believe, if you don't believe this record, the Bible says, you are calling God a liar. Verse 11, and this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Very simple statement. In this statement, you're going to find three things. This is the record. God hath given. Given. It's not earned. It's not merited. It's grace. This is what it is. This means you have grace. It's given to you. Eternal life. Eternal means forever. Eternal means it never ends. And this life is in his son. It's through Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you don't believe this record, these three things, so you're calling God a liar. And I believe these are the three things. Like if, you, if, you, if any one of these is missing, you're not saved. For example, if you don't think that God has given it to us, if you think it's earned on your merit, you're not saved. 
If you think there's another way other than through his son, Jesus Christ, you're not saved. And if you don't think that it is eternal life, life that lasts forever, that never ends, you are not saved. Very straightforward, very simple, but inherent to the gospel, eternal security of the believer, believing that it does last forever, believing that once you are saved, you are always saved. And that's why it concludes here in verse number 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So I've told you this stuff so you can know. If eternal isn't eternal, if we could lose our salvation, then you can never know that you're saved. You can never know that you have life that never ends. Right. And that's why so many people, we, first question, one of the first questions we ask people, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And I usually emphasize 100%, do you know for sure? And when people start to think about it a little bit, well, I, say, I mean 100% for sure. Because that really gets them thinking a lot. I mean, I have a lot of people say, well, I'm pretty sure. The reason why they're pretty sure is because there's still some doubt in, is what Jesus did enough for me? Because they still think, well, maybe there's something I can do where God will send me to hell. You haven't put all of your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Either Jesus paid for all of your sins or he didn't, right? Very simple. He either paid for it all or he didn't. Either what he did was sufficient or it's not. If you think you could lose your salvation, then you are not trusting that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is enough to save you and to keep you saved. If what he did is not enough, if you don't think it's enough, then you are forced to put some faith on yourself and your obedience to God's law to save you. And those are works. And you frustrated the grace of God. The Bible says in Galatians 2, 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That means that Christ died for nothing. If your righteousness, if your obedience to God's law could save you in any way, then Christ had no reason to come. You have to abandon the righteousness that you think you can receive through obeying God's law and put all of your faith on Jesus Christ to save you. It's the only way you can be saved. And that is the only way you can truly have grace in God's eyes. That's what grace is. You're not frustrated. You're not trying to confuse that grace, the mercy that God has extended to you, the free gift that God has extended to you with your own merit, your own good works. It's not hard to be saved at all. What a person believes determines whether they're going to heaven or hell. It's as simple as that. We're all sinners that deserve hell every day of our lives. Every single day you commit a sin that, that would damn you to hell. Every day. Me too, all of us. We're not, we are so far from being perfect. And that's why you need to have humility in order to get saved at all because you have to just recognize, wow, I am a sinner and I don't deserve heaven at all. Right. There was a point in my life where I thought I was pretty good and I deserved heaven. Because I didn't steal. I didn't kill people. Oh yeah, I didn't steal. Oh, but there was that one time. Right? There's, there's always that, well, well, I did, you know, but, you know, everybody does that, Right? I, mean, oh, I was just kind of stupid then. You know, downplay what I did wrong. It's the attitude. It's the, I, I had that attitude. The majority of people have that attitude. Not that bad. Never raped anybody. Well, congratulations. Come watch my children because you never raped somebody. Yeah. Good for you. You never actually pulled the trigger and shot and blew someone's brains out. That, that you are just a wonderful person.
No, all we have to do is put our, all of our trust in the Savior. Amen. We need Him to save us. That's why we need a Savior. We can't do it. Save me. Save me, Lord Jesus. Trusting in you. And if you believe that some sin could take away your salvation or that you had to somehow live a decent life to get saved, then you were not saved because you did not put all of your faith in Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. And if that's something that you believe, then get saved today. You know, call on him and trust him with all your sight. And you know what? He'll seal you. This is why we have Ephesians 1. I'll close on this. Ephesians chapter 1. We have this verse printed on our uh, invitations. And if you were unaware of that, you know, well, now you're aware of that. And you can use this verse also to point to people, to show them this doctrine, because this, again, proves the doctrine that once you're saved, you're saved forever. It's eternal life. You have eternal security because God seals you. So the moment you get saved, the moment you believe, hey, God puts a seal on you. It's God's seal. You can't remove that seal. You can't pluck yourself out of God's hand. Once you're in God's hand, once he sealed you, man, you're a seal. Until the day of redemption, when he, when he redeems what he bought, what he purchased, he, he paid for you. He bought you with the blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to him. You, you could try to trash yourself as much as possible, but you know what? The day is going to come where he's going to redeem his purchased possession. So I've already bought and paid for you. I'm taking you back. Ephesians 1, verse number 13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. These words keep coming up. Promise, eternal, salvation, believe, you're sealed, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. He said, and that Holy Spirit that he's giving you, that seal that, he's, that he sealed you with, he said, that's just the earnest. An earnest is like the down payment, right? It said, when, when you buy a house, you put down earnest money. The earnest money you put on a house, you don't get, that's non-refundable. You can never, if you back out of the deal, you can't get that back. But what the earnest is, it means it's showing your intentions of, I am earnestly showing you that I am going to buy this house. So I'm giving you this good chunk of money that I'm not going to walk away from because this shows you my seriousness of completing what I said I was going to do. I told you I was going to buy this house. Here you go. I'm proving it because I'm not going to walk away on that. See, we think of it in terms of money. It's like, yeah, but you could turn your back on money. Yeah, God gave us the earnest of the Holy Spirit. He's not going to turn his back on that. That's way more valuable than any earnest money you put down in a house, but it's the same concept of something saying that, yeah, I'm not, uh, this, this proves my sincerity. This proves that I am true to my word because I'm giving you the spirit until I come back and redeem what I've bought in full. Praise God Amen. for the freeness of salvation, for the sureness of salvation, that we could trust, truly trust his word. And isn't it funny, the one thing that we have to do to be saved, believe his word, is the only thing you have to do to understand eternal security, believe his word. Believe that God's promise is true. Believe that when he says eternal life, it's eternal. Just believe. The simplest, easiest thing imaginable that, that, that would need to be done on our part shows you how much God loves you. Couldn't make it any easier. It's an important doctrine. We will never, ever, ever, ever budge. I mean, this is, this is like, th this determines salvation. Now, not every, we're going to be going through this series. Not every doctrine is going to be this hardcore on, you know, like if you don't believe this, you're not saved necessarily. But, but this one, absolutely, without a doubt. If you ever leave this church and go to some other church, you better make sure that th they believe this. They believe in eternal security of the believer because otherwise they're not even saved.
Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for that free gift that you've given us. God, we love you. We love your words. I pray that you would please help us to make your words easily understood. Dear God, the concept is so simple. And so many people have been confounded and confused and turned around and, and, and have uh, various notions on what it takes to be saved. God, help us, teach us, train us, dear Lord. Lead us to people that we can just show the truth from your word, that we can lead people to Christ, that we could, we could help people to understand the, the, the beauty and, the, and the, the love that you have for us by giving us this free gift that lasts forever. God, help us to make it easily understood. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.